just do the right thing don't be in a hurry like you know a lot of entrepreneurs right they are very they are always i have seen like especially in the indian ecosystem they are always in a hurry quarter on quarter month on month right and my advice to them is guys take a step back assess what problem you are solving and have patience about it and talk to your investors about that tell them that hey 6 months you you have to wait there's no other option we'll do it the right way and i think if you have the right people on board in terms of team in terms of investors in terms of partners they will give you that time to do the right thing Bring it. So hi, hello everyone. This is Startup Story Spotlight. Uh, this and I am your host Lata. This is where we interview amazing founders, entrepreneurs, investors, and startup leaders, and uh, we learn about their insightful journey with us. And in today's episode, we have a very interesting guest, Mr. Rahul Singh, who is a co-founder at Eco Home Soul. and um he is here to j- uh, share his journey with us today at eco soul home uh rahul how are you lata thank you so much for having me and i'm doing great uh like you know beautiful delhi weather today so it's amazing Ooh, wow awesome uh so rahul let's start a bit about you and your journey and uh what what do you do at eco soul home Yeah, hey, thanks, Lata. So essentially, uh, like you know, so I'm one of the founders of Eco Soul. Uh, my co-founding partner Arvind and I started this company in 2020 in Boston, USA. Uh, we are still headquartered in Boston, and uh, congratulate us on our timing. We started the company, and then there was first wave of COVID, and then second wave of COVID, and third wave of COVID, and uh, which is, by the way, both good and the bad, right? You know, of course, bad, like you know. Created a huge stress on the on the entire planet, right? Uh, but also, it awakened our souls a little bit about environment, about how connected we are, how about sustainability matters, right? So I think that's when we started the company. And happy to say that, uh, like two and a half three years down the line, we are one of the largest eco-friendly products brand in the world. Uh, today we are present in eleven countries, including USA, Canada, Mexico, UK, Germany, UAE, India. China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia. I'm so happy. It's actually eleven, guys. Yeah. So, so I think that's that's something good, right? Today we are very excited about Asia Pacific per se, right? Both from as a sourcing market, right? We have a huge presence in India. In Asia, we work with more than hundred contract manufacturers. But what excites me even more is the sustainability shift that is happening in Asia. And when 1.4 billion people change their habits of going and become sustainable, it truly drives an impact on the planet. So that's what is very exciting about the journey so far for you. That's that's crazy. I agree. I agree with the sustainability, especially in the Asia and the Indian market. That's that's that that's definitely there. Uh, so Rahul, just to understand what uh, sustainability challenges uh, you're addressing to exactly at Eco Soul Home and how? Yeah, Lata. So first of all, right, you know, we are all we are all consumers, right? Okay, and uh, let's be honest here, like you know, we are we all work on a budget, right? Uh, so one of the biggest challenges that we saw three years back when we actually started this company is that almost eighty percent of the consumers they want to go sustainable. Nobody raises their hands and say like you know, hey, I I love plastic. I want to consume plastic. I want to live by plastic, right? But also, you know that plastic is durable. Plastic is ubiquitous. Plastic is cheap, right? So the biggest challenge that Eco Soul is basically solving for is making plastic. Sustainable. So making plastic not break your brands right you know so essentially everything that we produce and we sell are single use plastic alternatives but we they are extremely affordable right so we are actually the first company in the world which has been able to get the price point of non plastic products within the 20% range of plastic products right and that's where we think a massive consumer shift will happen in terms of adoption of these products where you don't have to say like okay i have to pay two times the price or three times the price in order to go sustainable so i think that's the sustainability challenge that we are solving for at ecosol 
Awesome. So Rahul, I have two follow-up questions on that. Actually, uh, recently I saw uh, your article about the reuse uh, plastics and how they're more dangerous than anything else on the planet right now. Do you want to elaborate? Uh, do you want to in? Do you want to give us some light on that? So I think there are two parts to that answer, right? You know, the first part is like just from a pure consumer awareness perspective. Today on our planet, less than 5% of the plastic, recyclable plastic, actually gets recycled. Okay, so let's just take a pause on that. So there is a whole bunch of plastics that we consume, of which a small bunch is recyclable. And even on that small bunch, only 5% gets recycled, right? So that's the reality of life, right? So one, the recyclable plastics, while it's a huge part, right, you know, that we all want to recycle, it just does not add up in terms of circular economy. The second is when we actually recycle the plastic, so there is a cost of transporting that plastic to the factory. Then there are multiple chemicals and melting processes that are used in order to recycle that plastic. But I... And the third thing is, after you recycle that plastic, another single-use plastic product gets created. So when you look at the entire carbon footprint of the value chain, right, it's actually more dangerous to the environment than actually just producing plastic a virgin plastic out of a petrochemical plant is actually much less carbon footprint than actually trying to recycle the whole thing, right? Yeah. And what we have to be aware of as consumers is that the overall impact on the planet and just not the use of the product impact. That's true. So, uh, so essentially, uh, now nobody can actually get away saying, oh, uh, but we are recycling the plastic because that's actually more harmful, right? That's actually more toxic. So yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Very true. And another, I'll add one more thing to this. Think also biodegradable. So nowadays we we hear a lot of greenwashing terms like you know, hey, this is an oxo biodegradable plastic, right? Uh, just remember, oxo biodegradable will probably take five years to biodegrade than five hundred years. Okay, mm -hmm. but when it does. It still becomes microplastics. It still ends up in our groundwater. It still ends up in our food chains, right? So it's not like when plastic degrades, it's a good thing for environment. In fact, Europe just recently passed a legislation to ban all oxidized biodegradable plastics in Europe. So consumer yeah. awareness becomes a very important part on how we really think about plastics. Yes. And I think I, uh, I, I, because, because I, of course, did some research on you as well. And I did go through your profile. And uh, I think you guys are working with some academic institutions as well to create consumer awareness about eco friendliness in the environment, right? Uh, recently, I think you've partnered with I am uh, Raipur. Uh, do you want to shed some light on that as well? So we are today actually, and of course we have many global partnerships, but very recently we have signed three partnerships in India, right? Mm -hmm. So one is with IM Raipur, right? And the partnership with IM Raipur is more about, you know, India is a treasure trove of sustainable products, right? Mm -hmm. I remember growing up in India and essentially my daddy used to have thala, right? It's right. the most eco-friendly yeah. thing you can do, right? Very, in life, yeah. right? <laughs> so... Uh, I don't know where we lost the way we went from that thala to like actually using a lot of plastic bags. But with I am Raipur, we are saying that there are a lot of entrepreneurs in India who actually want to work in the field of sustainability. So we are basically creating an accelerator slash entrepreneurship program in coordination with I am Raipur to develop those entrepreneurs. Okay, so that's our first partnership in India. The second partnership with India is with uh, C.V. Raman University, right? What we are doing there is essentially doing ground level training on how to produce eco-friendly products. Okay, so we are sharing our technical know-how, we're sharing our patents, we're sharing our technology, and we are saying that, hey, this can not only generate rural employment, but also, right, you know, help people move towards sustainability by producing some of these products locally. And right. of course, we are also the buyer of those products that we can actually take those products to the world, right? The third uh, partnership that we recently announced in India is with Krishi Kalpa, okay? So one of the things that we have now started doing is the most sustainable way of sourcing the raw material is directly from farmers. Because farmers get to an aggregator, aggregator gets to a trader, trader gets to a factory from where we buy it. I'm just saying like, let's just 
cut down this entire supply chain, buy directly from the farmers, work with the NGOs who are working directly with the farmers. One, the dollar economy gets to the last person. Okay, so yeah. they are the biggest beneficiary of that financially. Also, we get a very stable supply chain source as we source directly from the farmers and we can actually do a better quality control. But the third and the most important thing is that that supply chain continues to become more and more and more sustainable, right? So those are three big partnerships that we have recently signed in India. That's interesting. That's, of course, very interesting. Uh, I can, of course, India is, everyone. everyone's betting on the success of India right now. So I, I hope this becomes a part of it and I, I guess it will definitely. Um, I, okay. I, I think there are two angles to that though, by the way, right? I'm sorry if you were going to the next question, but I, uh, I would say like, you know, I, I'll tell you the sad part. The sad part is I still source 65% of my products from China. Okay, when we think about the markets like US, Canada, and Europe. Uh, I'll tell you why it is sad, because in order to develop any product market manufacturing hub, right, there are three things that are required. The availability of the raw material, availability of technology, and availability of talent pool. Let's just assume capital is available, right? There's no dearth of capital in India today, right? India is very rich in all three of these. In fact, the products that I source today, India is extremely rich in raw material, very high quality talent pool, and there is no dearth of technology. The machines are being produced in India now. Uh, unfortunately, there are no scaled players yet. So we need the we actually need the policy push there, right? In order to really make India the green hub. But I think this is an opportunity which is as big as the IT opportunity for India. There was an IT revolution 25 years, 30 years back. And the green products revolution is happening right now. And India can be at the forefront and become the global manufacturing hub for these products. Uh, we are doing our part of that. We are basically, we set up a factory near Bangalore. We are now setting up a factory near Noida. So we are doing our part in moving some of the green product supply chains to India. But we need, I think, 100 more entrepreneurs like me who actually can actually make a mark on the global scale for India. No, no, of course, this is a journey and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure India will uh, stand on that, on those expectations for sure. So, yeah, that, that's definitely sure. Um, also, Rahul, a very follow-up question. Uh, it's, it's kind of assumed, uh, those who are not very aware, uh, that the eco-friendly products are, uh, are not very attractive. In the sense, are they're not very, very are not very attractive in the look alike and in the feel, right? Do you have okay. any statement to say on that? Please go ahead. And how is EcoSoul working towards creating some cheek products uh, that actually awe the customer? Absolutely. So I think uh, you know when I, whenever we look at product, right? You know, we look at it from three angles. Like one is the real product usage, right? Right. Okay. So. Think, think of a regular paper plate, right, for example, right? So you remember this paper plate that we find everywhere, right? If you put like pav bhaji on top of that plate, the plate would bend, right? They're not right. very sturdy, right? Yeah. So that's a pure play product specification play. The second is the look and feel and the functionality. So let me give you an example. This fork, you know, this fork yeah. looks like plastic, behaves like plastic, more sturdy than plastic. It's not plastic. It's 100% compostable not biodegradable it's 100 percent compostable okay that means when you put it back in your backyard it, it really looks plastic. like plastic honestly it's not okay actually coincidentally i also have this glass here like you know can you see this glass yes looks like looks like a plastic glass yes so so yes it, yes it it isn't right so it's 100 percent compostable again right so one, so that is basically from a product usage perspective that, hey, I'm looking, I'm now using an eco-friendly product. It's not feeling weird. It's regular use product I have, right? Yeah. So I think that's the second thing we are doing. The third thing is, of course, the affordability part, right? That basically like, you know, hey, this fork costs same as the plastic fork, right? So you don't have to actually break your bank in order to do that. The fourth thing that we are doing, which is even more amazing, is that we are bringing brand new products to the market. So think about fully compostable Ziploc bags, like resealable bags, right? So we are one of the first options in the US shelves, which actually provides a fully compostable option. It's flying off the shelves now. 
we are creating partnership with some of the largest retailers in the world, which mm -hmm. is bringing free compostable diapers to the market and fully compostable female hygiene products to the market. How many okay. people actually know that these diapers and sanitary pads are actually plastic? There is I... no way to recycle them. They always land in a dump, right? A landfill. There is no way to recycle them. The only way to get rid of them is to incinerate them, literally burn them. And millions and millions of diapers and sanitary pads end up in landfill every single year. I agree, yes. yes. And we are bringing fully compostable options to the market. In fact, we have we have not announced it yet, but we are signing a global deal with one of the large US retailers to bring them to the market. So I think that's something that EcoSoul is trying to solve for, like bringing new products, doing original material research, getting better specifications, and more importantly, using eco-friendly products should not feel weird, right? It should feel like your regular usage, right? So I think that's something that we are frantically working on. After seeing the, uh, that cup and that spoon, definitely. I, I think very chic. <laughs> that, that's Thanks, actually Nara. really good. Uh, of course. Uh, Rahul, another question. Uh, you, you told me a lot of things that you're working towards in the same company. You, you're building eco-friendly products. It's tree free, plastic free. Uh, there's women empowerment involved. Uh, you're sourcing it directly from the farmer so that the a dollar reaches to the last mile. So a lot of this in the same company with the same mission, this is almost too good to be true. What how how are you guys doing it and what are the extra efforts you to put into that? So so Lata, uh, be honest, very honest there, like it's not it's not easy, right? Uh so when uh, like you know my founders and I right you know so essentially when Arvind and I like we started that company and uh, my wife also joined us in the effort right uh, the three of us like we said that hey guys if we have to build a company which truly solves the problem of being eco friendly right so we have to make the DNA of the company right we cannot evolve into a sustainable company right it's not going to happen right so from day zero we said like. From the first hiring, we said 50% has to be women employees. Like, just let's just make it a policy from day zero. When we actually were setting up the first factory, we said, hey, this first factory that we set up has to be in Tumkur region, like 170 kilometers from Bangalore, right? Because in order to set up a factory where you can directly source from farmers, you have to be aware where the farmers are, right? Yeah. You cannot set up a factory in the middle of Bangalore and think your farmers will come, will drive 170 kilometers to reach your factory. So you reach out to them, right? The third thing is, while it feels like, hey, we are uh, sourcing directly for the farmers, it's very beneficial, you know, for the farmers. Yes, it is. It is extremely beneficial for our consumers, right? The question also becomes how we are able to drive the price point so low without compromising on the quality, right? We have cut down every single middleman from the process. We have reached out to the people directly at the source. And all the all the benefits we got in terms of sourcing and pricing, we passed it on to our consumers, right? So that's how we tried to build the business, like from day zero, and we did not try to evolve into this, right? So I think that was the hard part because some of these choices were inefficient. Some of these choices were expensive. Some of these choices were very time-taking, okay? We delayed our first product launch by six months just to get this right first, right? Get the back end right. And trust me, the consumers will award you, the investors will award you, the market will award you for doing the right thing. It just comes naturally from there. So the lesson is do the right thing. You will get rewarded. Just do the right thing. Don't be in a hurry. Like, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, right? They are very, they're always, I have seen like, especially in the Indian ecosystem, they're always in a hurry, quarter on quarter, month on month, right? And my advice to them is, guys, take a step back, assess what problem you are solving and have patience about it and talk to your investors about that. Tell them that, hey, six months, you, you have to wait. There's no other option. We'll do it the right way. And I think if you have the right people on board in terms of team, in terms of investors, in terms of partners, they will give you that time to do the right thing. But compromising today will not get you the will not lead you to the vision that you start out of, started off with. So don't compromise on that. Vision and mission is, both are important, should go parallel. 
amen to that right absolutely please don't compromise on that time will like time will reward you for that fair and and i think entrepreneurship is not for uh, a short stint right not for 6 months 1 year 2 years 5 years it is for forever right that is that is true right you know uh, entrepreneurship is not a short term thing right entrepreneurship yeah. is not something hey i'll build something in 3 years i'll be at the helm of financial success please don't be an entrepreneur for that uh, the failure rate at in entrepreneurship is 98% right so if you're a good mathematician you would never be an entrepreneur right you know so essentially uh, please yeah so that's that's something to always keep at the back of your mind it's not okay. a short term game so uh, rahul on that note um, basically uh, i was going to ask you another question but because we mentioned about entrepreneurship and how uh, people are now perceiving it uh, in terms of investments and funding and all of that uh, what do you have to say to the public generally or the aspiring entrepreneurs um, who 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 just want to start their own startup by looking at shark tank and you know uh, the the craze that's been created around startup what do you want to tell to them just just in one line if you had to tell them give them a direction mentor them in that one line what would you say no absolutely and by the way shark tank is an extremely positive initiative i think uh, it made it uh, entrepreneurship uh, mainstream in india right uh, it's actually some of the stories that i've watched in shark tank india are very inspiring right and uh, some of the products that i discovered there were very inspiring right you know so i think that is extremely positive change that shark tank india is bringing to like you know to the masses in india uh, i would say especially when you think about entrepreneurship and funding right uh what i would really recommend is don't build your business on the basis of funding funding is a really important part as you scale right but please do not build a business that survives on funding right we very jokingly say within our company we are in the business of building a business we are not in the business of fundraising right uh in fact we made a very conscious size for the first 14 months of our journey like you know mm-hmm. 14 months of when our product was already in the market right mm-hmm. we did not raise any external funding and we have some truly inspiring examples here that like, you know in india we have zoho we have zerodha right you know who really scaled without funding and i have a lot of respect for those businesses because uh, it takes a lot of guts it takes a lot of belief in your business model right so before investors believe in your business model you have to believe in your business model like you know this was i'm solving a real problem right and it's going to lead to results so 14 months of our journey we did not raise any funding we proved the product market fit we got our traction we got our first retailer signed up uh it required a lot of sacrifices i sold my house right in order to fund my business so all of that but once we actually proved the product market fit then we went to the investors and said guys now we have to expand this globally this is a playbook that works okay and in order to lead global expansion we need to raise the funds now and this is where it really really like you know help in terms of uh, in terms of funding uh so rahul did you get your house back now i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> no i'm kidding i'm kidding uh, you you, okay. you don't have to answer that <laughs> no my you have to answer that so not that um, one yeah <laughs> oh no problem but i i'm sure you'd be having a better one now i think the company is growing tremendously agree yeah 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 but, uh, what i would say is like you know look houses come and go what we are building is much more exciting than that exactly exactly everyone should hear that that's true that's true. uh now coming back to our eco friendly environment uh there's actually a lot of green washing which is happening in the industry right now right can you describe why uh, your products are genuinely sustainable for our environment yeah and uh, actually a lot of onus on that is on consumer itself right you know that you know we have to be vigilant against green washing right so there are three three four things that we do right like you know when we actually like you know build products at eco soul so all of our materials all of our products all of our processes 
are certified by leading agencies of the world. So we don't call ourselves eco-friendly. When you say like TUV Austria will call us eco-friendly, USDA will call us eco-friendly, BPI will call us, call us eco-friendly, FSC will call, call us eco-friendly. So all the leading agencies of the world, right up to like carbon neutral business, right? They call us eco-friendly, okay? So we don't try to blow our own trumpet. And I think that is something like, you know, that consumers have to be very vigilant against. Like when they actually buy an eco-friendly product, please flip to the back of that box and say, who is actually calling this product an eco-friendly product? Is it the company itself calling ourselves eco-friendly or is it their, their certifying agency, right? That have truly uh, tested the products and then giving a certification, this is eco-friendly. So one we have done is like for years, like, you know, for a year and a half, we just continuously went into the process of making sure that all parts of our supply chain from right from materials, all the way it reaches to the consumer are certified by leading agencies of the world. Okay. The second thing is what we started doing is uh, like, you know, let's start thinking about the product materials that are today that are agro waste. Right. So we actually started a lot of material research in terms of bagasse, sugarcane bagasse, rice husk, wheat straw, corn starch, right? All of these, including palm leaf, all of these products, if they are not converted into products, all of these materials, if they are not converted into products, they, they have only one use to be burnt. So we always hear this parali problem, right? You know, pollution problem, right? A lot of uh, like, you know, uh, bagasse gets burnt in boiler, palm leaf gets burnt, right? You know, so essentially we started procuring some of these products, converting them into products that can be exported to the global market. And that's how we actually became more sustainable as a company. So certifications and product research is two key parts on how we become uh, a sustainable company. That's that's interesting. That's, that's, that's nice. Uh, because we've, we've seen, I think, uh, a lot of greenwashing uh, uh, campaigns that, that have gone around, including FIFA World Cup that happened recently. Right? A very That's huge right. one. Yes. Uh, but yes. I think we can go deeper in that later. Uh, but uh, And we as consumers of... hold the responsibility on that, right? You know, nobody <laughs> else is like, you know. In fact, I have three appeals to the consumers, whoever is actually consuming a product, right? I have three appeals for them, right? Please go First ahead. Is, please. Uh, sorry, let me just let me just say it out there. So consumers, whoever is watching this, please make note of these because consumer play the most important role in conserving the environment than any entrepreneur or anybody alone does. So please go ahead, Rahul. Yeah. So I have three appeals for them, right? So one is know the reality. Okay, only 2% of or less than 5% of recyclable plastics actually get recycled. Okay, so the war against plastic starts at consumption, right? If we consume a plastic bottle, we might think it get, it's going to get recycled because it's a recyclable plastic. It might not. So please know the reality, right? Secondly, check the product you are consuming, like... It says green on top, doesn't mean it's eco-friendly. Please check the bottom of that box, right? Right. So, and figure out if it's truly recyclable. Okay. And the third is awareness, awareness, awareness. Please Google, right? Today, uh, like, you know, uh, today information is not anyone's mandate, right? You know, information is very democratized. It's available everywhere. Just knowing that, that this glass exists, this is not plastic glass. Just knowing that, that this fork exists, not a plastic fork, I think that's also on consumers where actually you can simply go to Google or go to ecosolehome.com, right? And figure out there are so many alternative products, right? Uh, for the plastic products that we consume today. So I think these are the three appeals I have for all the consumers. I think Please there's also the a discount going on on Ecosol's website for Indian consumers, right? Do you want to mention that? There is a big sale going on for EcoSoul uh, consumers on the website. You can also join us on our Instagram campaigns, right? Uh, we are actually uh, now getting into offline retail as well. We really want to meet the consumers where they consume, right? Uh, so essentially, we are actually expanding our brand in India now. Uh, we launched our brand in India in December 2022, and uh, we are actually expanding frantically. Uh, in fact, you find you'll find us on Amazon. You'll find us on Flipkart. You'll find us in Big Basket, Amala, and a lot of platforms. 
right? Okay. So, but not being a not being just a, a proponent of my company, this is general appeal to the consumers. Please, guys, there are alternative products available. Just take a moment and Google them before you consume a plastic product. Yes, that's so true. Yeah. Uh, Beth, uh, Rahul, coming back to your company, it, it's after all a business, right? It needs money to survive. But we are right now in a place where funding um, is getting a little difficult, right? Uh, you have to put a lot of efforts to do that. Uh, tell us about your funding journey. Yeah, so as I said, like I started like in the first 14 months till the time we did not prove the product market fit. We did not try to raise any funding. <laughs> but one thing uh, what I've also discovered in the market is uh, there is no dirt of funding for good companies, right? So today, like, you know, when you think about some of the... You know, oh, sorry, I'll just pause you there. All the good uh, founders, entrepreneurs say that. All the good ones Please. say that. Yes. And uh, like every entrepreneur is a good entrepreneur, by the way, right? You know, it's just that some ideas work, some don't. It's okay, right? You know, it's okay to fail. It's okay to learn. Uh, some of the entrepreneurs that I've made who have made tremendous companies, that's your second company or third company, right? So you learn, right? So every entrepreneurship is like sports, right? You don't have a good day or a bad day. Like, you know, it's just learning process, right? Uh, having said that, right, you know, so essentially uh, be patient, right? Uh, today, we have some of the largest funds in the world who support us. Think Axel, think Sync Capital Partners, Founder Bank Capital, Wave Fund, right? Funds from Europe, funds from uh, Singapore, funds from India, funds from USA. Like, we have a lot of funds that are supporting our journey, right? Uh, we uh, In October, November, we closed our Series A, right? And we are very close to a Series B, right? Uh the only thing I would say is that bring the right investors on board who have the patience to grow with you, right? So there are a lot of investors who are willing to put money and they are very enticed by, hey, 4X, 3X in the next quarter. Do not get into that, okay? Be patient with your funding and be open with your investors what you're trying to build. It will take time, have patience uh, and bring the right people on board. But once you have the right people on board, once your business model is great, right? When you have proven the product market fit, uh, there is still a lot of uh, there is still a lot of funds in the market, right? There's no dirt of fund. You, you have the right people, they will support you. Uh, having said that, we did thousand uh, percent growth last year. Like we did a ten x growth last year. Uh, we doubled our business between December and March. We are still doubling our business between now and June, right? So essentially. We are on an extreme growth growth path, okay? Uh, but more importantly, not only we are on an extreme growth path, we'll probably become profitable by the end of this year, right? So essentially, that's another important metric that uh, investors are increasingly looking at, that does this business, if not profitable today, has a real potential to become profitable at some point in time? Or is it going to be a money sink for foreseeable future? So I think those are some of the questions if we can answer, right? Uh, good businesses will always have good money following them. That's always true. That's never dealt of capital, like you said. Understood. Uh, now, uh, because we don't have much time left, so Rahul, we'll do a quick rapid uh, question round sort of thing. Uh, oh my let God. Me ask. Okay. <laughs> it, it just, just answer very simply, very random, okay. very rapidly. Uh, Rahul, is entrepreneurship hard? Yes. How much? Do you, do you okay, have a scale? So, or is it 11 so on 10? When I, when, I, when I actually started entrepreneurship, and I know it's a rapid fire, so I'll be very rapid in my answer. When I started entrepreneurship, I actually went to the Oxford Dictionary to just look at the meaning of the entrepreneurship, how it is actually defined, right? Uh, so essentially, in Oxford Dictionary, it is defined as setting up a business activity which involves financial risk and financial successes, right? Of course, I'm putting this very simplistically, but it was more financial definition of entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship is much more than that. It will test your patience, perseverance, faith in yourself, faith in your business model, ability to work with people, right? Uh, no entrepreneur can do it themselves, right? They need very solid team, right? You know, uh, who supports them. So it's a lot and it's very hard uh, to build and it's, you're very lucky if you have the right team, right people, and right environment around you. So 
I'd true. say there's a lot that is not in your control. That's true. That's true. Uh, EcoSoul is uh, a great uh, example of making India for the world. Do you agree with that? And how much do you believe in the success story of India, the potential success story of India? We have everything that that is needed to make us the global eco-friendly product manufacturing hub, right? Mm -hmm. We are slow to start, to be honest, okay? And we are slow to execute. But I think the from a potential perspective, we could become the country that becomes the global hub for eco-friendly products, yeah. okay? Made in India for the world, right? Today, whatever we produce in India, we export almost 95% of it. Fair, fair. That's awesome. So you believe in very much the success story of India that, that's out there. Absolutely. 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 Yes. Double thumbs up on that one. Yeah. So you're definitely a patriot. 100%. Born Indian, always an Indian. Very fair. Um, awesome. Rahul, just in one line, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who want to build a sustainable business for the environment? The best time to start is now. Okay, yeah. we are at the right trend from a consumer perspective, from an economy perspective, from a policy perspective. Simple advice. That's true. That's true. Guys, forget just just leave everything. Start your sustainable business right away. Awesome, uh, Rahul. My third question is: uh, What is your relationship with your mentors and also with your employees? So there are two different set of people: your mentors and then your employees. What is your relationship with them that 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 keeps you going? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, when I say employees, by the way, I I'm talking about the team, right? And that's a very important distinction, right? So the team is someone who enables you to execute upon your vision, right? Uh, so I tell only one thing to my team, right? What we are doing is not only good for us, it's good for the earth, right? So let's be very driven by by that passion. Nothing that we are doing today is a rocket science. Nothing that we are doing today is hard and nothing that we are doing today is uh, sort of worth to be stressed about, right? So let's go solve a real problem, uh, like, you know, do something good and build a company that we are really proud of. So that's something that is my message, consistent message to the employees. Uh, about mentors, I will basically segregate them into two parts, right? You know, so they, I have had many mentors from whom I learned from whom I learned the business, right? Uh, I learned different skill sets. I learned how to take risk and manage risk, right? And I really learned how to build systems and processes to turn into, like, you know, to run a successful business, right? But those are one set of mentors, like I found them across the world, okay? Uh, but there is another set of mentors that I found in India, which were like even more inspiring, right? So I learned from a small shopkeeper, how do you run or manage the labors on the ground, right? I learned from my warehouse manager, who by the way is not even a graduate, I learned from him, how do you devise quality control measures that can be understood by someone who's only 10th grade pass out, right? Believe it or not, right? Running a business at a high level, data analytics, marketing looks amazing, but building a business from ground up requires you to know these skill sets as well. So I have had mentors who are right at the top of the corporate ladder, and I have had mentors uh, who some cases are my employees, like, you know, that I learned a lot from, right? So essentially, I would like to thank both sets of my mentors here. Okay. The rapid question went a bit, went a little huge, but 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 we got the we got the we got the idea how your relationship is with your employees and uh, your mentors, which is really great, by the way. Um, we Thank all you. want employers like you. Uh, okay. You. Last question. What advice? And uh, just give me one or two or three lines on this. What advice do you like to give to aspiring entrepreneurs who want to build a sustainable business for the environment? Absolutely. So guys, just if I want to capture it in one line, then it, the line goes like this, right? Sustainability is not just good for business. It is good business today, right? If you are thinking of building a business in the field of sustainability, first of all, write to me directly. Like, you know, I'm helping entrepreneurs across India. Feel free, free to do that. The second is essentially the time to start is now, right? 
India is going through a seismic customer change, customer mentality change, move towards sustainability. We are a three and a half trillion dollar economy now. We will be a ten trillion dollar economy in, in not so uh, distant can future. Can you that number? Can you can you highlight that number? Ten. Please say it with me. Trillion 10? dollar economy. Oh, yes. man. India yeah. will become a ten trillion dollar economy. I have absolutely zero doubt about that. So from three and a half to ten trillion dollar, guys, this is the time to be an entrepreneur. If I want to be an entrepreneur anywhere across the world, I would rather choose to be in India. So please do it. Do it now. Do it like you know. Don't think too much. Proud Indians on that. Uh, we are guys, absolutely proud Indians. Yes. Uh, so guys, that's that's it. That's it. That's that's the advice for the aspiring entrepreneurs and for consumers. If you're listening to this. Please go check out Eco Soul Home as well as join hands on this sustainable environment that we're trying to build for the future. Because, and Rahul, would you say it with me? We don't inherit we do earth from. We do not inherit earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. So look exactly. at your children and think you are borrowing it from them. And what are That's we leaving true. for them? The earth has to go on for as many years as it can. And we need to be responsible to be able to maintain that. It's, it's, it's a huge responsibility and we must take it on ourselves. We must. That's it. That's for consumers. Thank you so much, Rahul, for joining on this interesting conversation. It was so lovely having you here. Uh, such a down-to-earth person, like I said. Uh, such, a, uh, such an amazing entrepreneur, building great things. And, I, and we, we hope the best for you and your company going uh, forward. Uh, for consumers, 